Okay, uh, welcome everybody for this week's Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. Uh, we're very excited because we have a special uh, presentation this week. Um, my name is Mike Ivan. I'm the director of the, of the symposium and I'm joined today by my co-directors from here at the University of Miami, Dr. Jacques Morcos, who's professor and chairman of, the direct, of our, our program and also director of cerevascular and skull base. Uh, also Ricardo Komatar, who's one of our professors and, and uh, director of our residency program. He's director of our surgical neuro oncology program and the UMBTI. Um, and Carolina Benjamin, who's our, our newest uh, recruit, assistant professor, brain tumor and skull base specialist, and also the director of our Keynes lab. So uh, this week we put on, uh, every week we put on uh, these symposiums. This is the 19th week. We've had tremendous success with over uh, 5,000 views now ever since the beginning. Uh, and a lot of that uh, is due to our fantastic team that, have, that occurs behind the scenes. So Christina, Roberto, Ingrid, and Ignacio, uh, so many thanks to them for, for sending all the emails, doing all the artwork, and, and putting together these, these great symposiums. If anybody has any questions or, or about the symposiums, um, or our department, you could always find us on social media or the web. Uh, we're on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, as well as our website here. Uh, and please feel free to contest for anything. In addition, we have a, a kind of a matching symposium that happens on Thursdays, which is uh, focused on cerebral vascular and skull base, uh, run by my partner, Dr. Morcos. And tomorrow we have an exciting program talking about brainstem anatomy and brainstem cavernomas with Dr. Kadri and Dr. Hongo. Um, who have uh, phenomenal experience with these difficult lesions. So be sure to, to check that out tomorrow. Um, also a quick teaser for next week on our symposium, Anish Aghi is gonna be joining us from UCSF to talk about uh, Cushing's disease uh, and the approach for neurosurgeons. So make sure uh, you tune in next Wednesday, same time for that talk. Uh, some housekeeping before we begin uh, to all participants, please ask your questions using the Q&A or the chat button. We encourage you to be as interactive as possible, and we'll try to get to all the questions before the end of the symposium. We don't offer CME, but you will get an email confirmation um, uh, documenting your participation. And please be sure to like, follow, and share our videos. Uh, if you have to leave early or whatnot, these videos are recorded on YouTube, and you can uh, uh, check them out at a later date or check out all the other videos that are on there. Uh, there's really been some phenomenal, phenomenal talks, uh, and if you've missed any, I encourage you to check them out. This week, we have a great list of panelists uh, from across the country, uh, starting out with Dr. Rodriguez. She's an, an assistant professor and director of the Neurosurgical Oncology Program. She's a physician scientist and has her own lab at the University of Arkansas, where she focuses on brain tumors. Uh, with Brian, William, Brian Williams, who's an assistant professor of neurosurgery and director of the Brain Tumor Program at the University of Louisville. He's also part of the Restorative uh, Neuroscience Department and a brain tumor and skull base expert. Uh, he did his fellowship with Charlie Teo, who we just had um, a couple weeks ago. And Dr. Sarkis, uh, he's a, a neurosurgical oncologist and brain tumor expert at Dignity Health in, in Bakersfield, California, uh, and uh, a past fellow from our program here at University of Miami. So thank you all panelists for joining in, and I look forward to your cases. Uh, this week we have a, an outstanding uh, speaker, Dr. Maldon uh, is coming to us all the way from Brazil. Uh, he has over 25 years of neuro-oncology experience and is really world-renowned and recognized uh, for his work done on, on awake brain tumors uh, in neuro-oncology. He's given over 200 lect lectures around the world, has published uh, thoroughly on the topic. He's also uh, a visiting professor um, uh, at the University uh, at MD Anderson as well and is really integrated into their program. He's uh, Emeritus President of the Flank and founding president of the uh, for Society of Neuro-Oncology in Latin America, or SNOLA. Uh, and so a tremendous uh, effort that he's done so far in, in organizing neurosurgery in South America. And, and for that, uh, he should be really thanked. Uh, we're very, very excited about his talk today on uh, management of metastasis. This is probably the most common thing that all neurosurgeons have to deal with. Uh, and, and I can't think of anyone better to give the talk. So thank you so much for joining us uh, from Brazil. Thank you so much for this kind uh, invitation and uh, congratulations for this great program that you guys are providing to us. It's a great honor to be part of it and definitely you are helping the neuro-oncology all over with this a solid and very interesting program. Just let me, especially I'd like to thank you 
Ricardo, you, Michael, and uh, Jack for all this, uh, this kind of uh, invitation. Let me share my screen. Okay. Perfect. Okay, good. So we are going to discuss the management of uh, brain metastasis. Uh, you guys are going to see that uh, this is uh, this is very important. It's basically the most uh, common non-primary tumor of CNS, and uh, people are living more and more with cancer, and we have to deal somehow in their life is with uh, a brain metastasis or uh, adverse events related to it. So it's very interesting because we are seeing a, a huge changes in, in uh, paradigms and uh, treatment options regarding this uh, pathology. I have no disclosures for this uh, presentation. And I always would like to start uh, this kind of lecture with a simple but not so simple case. So if, if you have a patient 38 years old with a, a melanoma, diagnosed it seven months ago and started with uh, uh, dizziness, headaches, and uh, after doing this MRI, the oncologist put his on steroids. And uh, you can see how many considerations we can do it based only with this clinic and the MRI. So how should we treat the brain? Is it important any molecular information? We know this is a melanoma, but is there something more that uh, should be uh, crucial for defining treatment and prognosis for these patients and how should we stratify uh, this melanoma patient. Is there any rule for whole brain radiation nowadays? Is this uh, still a current uh, solid uh, treatment option? Surgery or radiosurgery for some specific lesions and the uh, benefits of each of, of uh, this uh, kind of modalities. How about steroids? We all know that steroids are our best friends in neurosurgery. We cannot live without steroids, at least uh, in the peri-operative uh, uh, time of uh, following these patients, but uh, maybe this is not so good for some kind of patients and how to deal with this new steroids uh, concept uh, and uh, So if you, if you have any other histology, how should we uh, deal with these patients? And uh, now in oncology, name is important, but the surname is most important. And uh, how should we deal with the surnames? And if all patients are immuno or target candidate, and this is definitely extremely important in our management. If this patient is not a melanoma, it's another somehow uh, diagnosis, how all this consideration uh, should be input or maybe we should do another consideration for each histologist that can or may affect the CNS. So we're gonna start with a brief overview of epidemiology, stratification, the molecular classification and clinic, and the role of surgery, the role of radiotherapy, and radio surgery, and finally the conclusions. Um, I'm just uh, would like to highlight that finally last year we have the first is no meeting fully dedicated from brain metastasis. That definitely, I think, uh, people all over the world are looking more carefully for this uh, disease. This is very important. And uh, when we see, when we talk about people, I'm I'm talking about the multidisciplinary team as well, the industry and uh, uh, pharmacological industry and technological industry. And uh, so all investments to this uh, pathology are related now as a good uh, or current uh, treatment and, and uh, an approach for this kind of disease. So when we talk about numbers, we know that 25% uh, of cancer patients uh, might develop a brain mat. People are living more and more. We have uh, excellent uh, treatment options for all kinds of uh, cancers nowadays. And somehow your patient might develop it during uh, his disease 
uh, develop some uh, brain mats or uh, carcinomatosis. And uh, we have an ex expectation of almost 200,000 people affected with uh, this problem in the United States. This is by CBTRUS uh, numbers. We know, and this is important, that some uh, uh, histologies has a high CNS neurotropies like melanoma, small cell, uh, lung cancer, renal cell, breast and testiculars and this is important as well because basically this patient should be followed carefully uh, since uh, diagnosis until the whole course of follow-up with uh, some uh, CNS uh, uh, investigation. But all cancers can affect the CNS, so even like uh, hair disease can affect the CNS like prostate, uh, ovarian, and, and thyroid. This is a very important issue because we ju I just mentioned that uh, we have a high number of patients affected by this disease. And uh, when we look at PubMed and, and uh, just type a brain med, we have over uh, 20,000 publications. But uh, in, when we Put it all this together in evidence-based medicine. We have just a few publications with a level one recommendations. We are going to mention a lot of trends, but unfortunately, evidence-based medicine for this kind of disease is uh, so far is not uh, as good as uh, we expected. So many of these uh, this, uh, treatment trends we are going to discuss are based in, uh, in retrospective analysis or meta-analysis or phase two studies. But uh, when we talk about the traditional radiotherapy, surgical resection, uh, radiosurgery and chemotherapy, we have just a few uh, good uh, papers that are recommended as, as a level one of recommendation uh, to approach uh, these patients. Uh, this is clearly when we, we look uh, carefully uh, to the incidence in, in uh, United States in 2019. So brain metastasis definitely uh, are very common, pretty much like uh, breast cancer and lung cancer. But when we look to the, to the main Congress in the world, in the oncology point of view, the ASCO, we have just a few uh, abstracts uh, regarding brain metastasis and unfortunately when you go to clinicaltrial.com uh, 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 you can see just a few uh, prospective uh, studies going on and active uh, prospective studies. So as I mentioned before the pharmacological industry just uh, closed Closer, they used to close their eyes to this uh, pathology. If, your pace, if their patients has some brain metastasis, they, they, they uh, used to not be included in, in clinical trials, but this is changing so far. We are gonna discuss this, uh, that uh, probably CNS is the new uh, good uh, uh, scientific uh, target for uh, research and, and, uh, and the pharmacological research as well. You guys all know how all these uh, mechanisms of, of uh, CNS uh, metastasis that uh, the dissemination routes, hemat hematogenic uh, direct extension, migration, or even iatrogenic seeding, as uh, uh, commonly we, we, we see this in a posterior fossa surgery. And, uh, but uh, basically, when we talk about the uh, physiopathogenic uh, of uh, brain metastasis, we all know the seed and soil and the BBB concept, the, the blood-brain barrier that uh, are limiting uh, treatment options, but uh, things are changing and we're gonna show you how. So even the seed and soil theory are updated. We have uh, this uh, new uh, adaptation of the lesion in the, the, the brain microenvironment with uh, micro and macro metastasis and how does it uh, uh, develop it and follow the traditional oncogenical uh, process in the brain. We know that this is all genetic and modulated mainly by the STAT3 and uh, basically uh, the metastasis can seed, can soil, but can uh, grow into the brain become invisible, invisible from the immunomodulation uh, and, and uh, the 
T cell army cannot uh, recognize and all immu uh, immunomarkers cannot uh, recognize it, this lesion as a foreign brain that uh, doesn't, uh, uh, it's not a part of the brain and should be destroyed. But uh, with this new trends of uh, treatment uh, in target therapy and uh, immunotherapy as well, uh, these lesions are becoming more visible and definitely more treatable than we are used it with. When you talk about this stratification, for many years, I'm, I've been working with brain metastasis since my fellowship at MD Anderson uh, 20 years ago. And uh, we are used to use the RTOG, RPA, the Gaspar publication, uh, dividing this lesion in class one, two, and three. Even now, when you look at some publications, RPA are continues using as one good uh, stratification uh, and prognostic uh, factor and still using. But uh, we can see that uh, definitely we have some kind of uh, uh, old trend and uh, people used to treat these uh, lesions based on RPA like uh, Patients with uh, good RPA, I mean one and two, are or supposed to be good candidates for surgery up front, and patients with any RPA uh, supposed to be good candidates for some kind of a radiotherapical treatment like a radio surgery or, or whole brain radiation. But we are seeing that uh, uh, things are changing nowadays. After that, we have this good. Uh, JPA, the RTOG, new the Sperduto publication, uh, dividing by histology. And then you can see some prognostic factors for small uh, cell and, and non-small cell cancer, carcinomas, melanomas, breast, renal cell, and GI cancers. But when you look carefully to it uh, now, this is uh, a diagnostic, a specific, but this is not so far uh, very updated, it's outdated. Uh, and then when we even check uh, this new tool that the Dr. Esperduto provided to us, that the brainmetgpa.com, that we use it to access easily from our cell phones, uh, we can see the main G GPA index and you can stratify these patients. But when you, it, it might be uploaded as well. Now, when you talk about lung cancer, we have a EGFR, all positive or negative, but we, we have now new markers and uh, very important ones with a good uh, uh, targetable treatment option as well. So the, even the brain met the GPA should be updated uh, every three or six months because things are changing really fast nowadays regarding this kind of uh, uh, pathology. When you talk about the molecular classification and their clinical implication, this is very important. So this is the main difference uh, and uh, probably a landmark uh, um, uh, important uh, uh, tool and important uh, information and knowledge that should be applied for all patients. Now we cannot use only the name of the disease, the histology. We should always look for the surname, for the genetical and molecular identity for each histology. And this is very important. This is very important also for the incidence uh, from diagnosis or during the disease. For each histology, you can, you can have like a, a, a uh, high incidence of uh, brain meds at diagnosis, or we can expect that during treatment uh, uh, a high number of uh, brain meds. So we, you, you can deal with your each, for each patient, depending on the surname, depending on the genetic and molecular uh, identity, uh, our expectations to the brain. All these uh, targetable oncogenic drivers are important. So we have EGFR, we have ALK, we have MET, we have HER2, have ROS, BRAF for melanomas, we have RET, we have uh, any tracks, and this is very important because we, because we have a lot of uh, good uh, uh, any track uh, inhibitors. We have a MEC, 
And uh, if, you, if we check the phase and, and the science based on for each one, we have a lot of approved drugs that, uh, that are targetable, but uh, we are still learning how each of them are affected the brain. And th this, is, this is very important because we have this uh, excellent uh, uh, targetable uh, checkpoint or targetable oncogenic driver with a good uh, selection of uh, treatment option clinically, but uh, how does it work to the brain is so far not clear. And this is the, the, the changing that we are noticing in the last couple of years. In the beginning, the pharmacological industry just avoid to uh, include our patients with brain mats in any kind of protocol. They are, they are excluded. No, oh, this is a brain mat, let's take it out. Now, they are looking to the brain uh, basically because they ha we have a high, higher incidence of the disease into the brain during uh, the patient's uh, life and the uh, patient surviving more and more. And definitely uh, the industry are, are, are now looking, uh, the pharmacological industry now are looking very carefully to the brain. And this is interesting for us because this is changing our concept of how we look at, at a, a, a solitary or oligometastatic to the brain or multiple brain metastases and and for us neurosurgeons, how we should deal with it in, in this new molecular and uh, genetic uh, era. So, a few years ago, when we, if, 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 if I'm presenting this lecture, definitely chemo uh, supposed to not be part of it. And now, based on all these oncogenic drivers, we have a lot of uh, target therapy that uh, uh, could be uh, good results. Uh, treatment to the brain, uh, focus on in GFR, ALK, HER2, BRAF, KIRAS, pd one and, 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 and uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and the immunotherapy as well. And uh, immunotherapy definitely is, uh, is, uh, is, is being up to date uh, and changing and creating new paradigmas that uh, we are going to discuss. This is just an example uh, in this Esperduto. Uh, publication that depending on the surname we expected a long uh, a long-term long survival for patients even with, with a terrible disease like uh, a lung cancer we have a specific drugs that uh, uh, changing the perspective to treat uh, this kind of patient and uh, as I mentioned before the ALK and NGFR are targetable places and when we talk about lung cancer, definitely this should be addressed and, uh, and discussed with the multidisciplinary team. For my whole life, I've been working with this. This is the classic uh, 1990 Petcho publication that uh, for a, a single brain mat, we should, or the best treatment option is surgery followed by uh, whole brain radiation. I think most of you guys uh, learned the neurosurgery like this. And this is our traditional trend of treatment. But uh, when we look for a new uh, flow chart of a lung cancer, surgery is not uh, the big player anymore. We can see the first question that we should address is, the, is this patient uh, present any kind of driver mutation, yes or no? If yes, is that a target bow? Is there any protocol that I can address and how each of that drugs that I mentioned before uh, could affect the CNS? And after that, if you have any issue regarding any lesion, especially, then you can have surgery or maybe uh, a radiotherapy strategy like uh, radiosurgery or whole brain radiation. For no driver mutation as well, even uh, we discuss a systemic therapy, but uh, for symptomatic uh, patients, Surgery is still a good uh, player and uh, maybe a big player uh, to deal with this, uh, this disease. But this is, how, this is just to highlight the importance that uh, our traditional uh, uh, treatment uh, direction, like, oh, this is a single mat, let's do surgery followed by uh, whole brain radiation is not anymore so important 
as used to be. When I talk about melanoma, we have this uh, BRAF, uh, TKIs, uh, drugs with a very good uh, response rate, almost 40%. And this is, uh, this is, so this is just to also highlight that for almost all uh, brain metastasis in a high CNS tropism, you have a name and a surname as well. So when we talk about melanoma, is there a BRAF mutated melanoma? This is the main question that we should address before discuss any kind of uh, treatment options. If not, if you don't have this kind of option, we should look carefully. And how about immunotherapy? Is this patient uh, immunocandidated? Is there any drug that can help the disease systemically and into the brain as well? This is a complex slide for a neurosurgeon. We are used to find ourselves trying to location the sylvian fissure, not, to understand, not trying to understand a graphic like this, but uh, basically, is just to highlight that uh, the tumor cell has, uh, should present some kind of uh, checkpoints in the cell surface like a pd one or CTLA-4 and uh, with all this connection recruiting dendritic cells, macrophages and uh, if you combine together and make this uh, tumor cell visible as I mentioned, as I mentioned before uh, uh, you might have the, the recruit of the T killer's army and destroy the tumor. This is an example. A few years ago, an oncologist just called me, oh, can you help me with this patient? I have this melanoma patient with uh, three or four brain mats, one of them around the three centimeters with some kind of brain edema, and uh, he asked me to take it out. And then I look at this uh, PET scan and say, are you sure? Look at this disease, it's everywhere. Why should I, you know, address and operate this brain and how should I have affected the outcome of this patient? No, this is an immune candidated and uh, we are going to start a new immune protocol with uh, some uh, anti-PD-1 and PD-1 uh, uh, drug. And uh, okay, let's do it. Let's do the surgery. It's not a big deal for us. And surprisingly, after three months of this immunotherapy, uh, in, a, in a combined strategy with a CTLA4 and a, a PD-1 uh, uh, anti-drug, we have this kind of result. And where's the disease? The disease just disappeared. And then we should realize, and how about the brain? Can the disease uh, disappear at the brain as well? And, uh, and then we started all this discussion uh, all over the world about the effect of this uh, new strategies into the brain. And for us, neurosurgeon uh, and uh, radio oncologist, uh, definitely our best friend, the steroids, is a big villain. Uh, surgery has the benefit when you operated a guy with uh, some kind of uh, edema related to a brain mat, when you take it out, you can drop off your steroids as soon as possible. Maybe in one or two weeks, your patient is totally uh, without withdraw, totally withdraw your, your steroids. On the other hand, when you use to do like a radio surgery for a, a brain lesion located in an eloquent area, you might have some problems with steroids. And as we are going to discuss uh, further on, radio, we are expecting these patients to live longer and radio surgery has a progressive uh, failure rate over the years. And this failure are related with steroids as well, uh, how any time of this uh, disease progression. So this is something that we should consider. So sh sh should we need to, to put our patients off steroids? Oh yeah, so surgery is a big uh, player so far. Oh, steroids is not a big uh, problem. We have small lesions. Okay, radio surgery is an excellent tool. This is clearly, the, in the last years, we can see that the patients that they used to, to, to use uh, in a long-term steroids during uh, uh, their diseases in, in the brain, they live uh, shorter than patients uh, that are not using steroids up front. We have a significant uh, difference uh, for a progression-free survival and overall survival regarding steroids as well. 
And when you talk about uh, this uh, steroids, maybe if we, if we have a local control with uh, not surgery, but maybe radio surgery, we, we might uh, have some kind of uh, exposure of antigens and uh, maybe we should uh, uh, become this patient more immunofavorable immuno for treatment. And this is the new trend as well. Uh, most of these immune candidates, they have a good uh, symbiosis and synergies between radiosurgery and immunotherapy. So immunotherapy and target therapy are not replacing surgery or radiosurgery as well. Indeed, we are trying to find uh, the, the, the role of each one combined together. And clearly, clearly, we are also understanding better these uh, new treatment options. We just uh, the, the, the neuro-oncological community just realized that a, a single agent immunotherapy, uh, they tend to be effective, but if you combine two modalities and strategies of uh, immunomodulators, you have a significant uh, results and, uh, and good results uh, regarding progression-free survival and, uh, and overall survival and local control and distant control into the brain. This is a typical example. In the right side, we have uh, 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 carcinomatosis, a meningeal carcinomatosis. The disease is, uh, is all over. This is a melanoma uh, without the BHF mutation. And I started the combination of a knee or for two uh, immunomodulator and this is uh, after one year of this strategy there is no disease into the brain we are talking about uh, carcinomatosis and meningeal this is a terrible disease we are used we are used to have like a four to six months of survival for this patient and now we are now we are talking about a long-term survival so and then we have to realize that uh, maybe we can offer more than our traditional omaya with uh, intraventricular uh, injection of uh, some kind of chemotherapy to these patients. Finally, we are all surgeons and uh, definitely surgery is trying to find uh, its way into all these new concepts. And uh, is there a rule of surgery? Definitely yes, it's still yes. And we're gonna discuss some of them. We, we respected all the traditional neuro-oncological, neurosurgical oncological concepts of accessibility, recyclability, and quality of life. We used to have all these surgical criteria that size, location, histology, age, KPS, and general condition. We are all worried about, oh, this is an oncological patient. He's not in a good shape. Maybe he's not a good uh, surgical candidate, and how is the, the primary status of the disease? And now, definitely, we should include it as well, as I mentioned before, this kind of uh, uh, if the patient is a, is a immuno or targetable uh, treatment candidate. But even following these criteria, we have some situations. And uh, the main issue when we are talking about uh, brain metastasis, this is not a single physician patient. This is a, it's crucial to have a multidisciplinary discussion and uh, you as a neurosurgeon should apply your common sense and uh, not be focused only in protocols. This is an example. Oh, this is a patient with a huge posterior fossa, melanoma metastasis with a KPS of 60. If you follow the tradition or the, the old trend, oh, this is a, a lower than a, it's a KPS below 70, it's 60, and has a, a intracranial uh, hypertension, is not a good candidate for surgery. But clearly, if you remove this lesion, as we did it after uh, second day, the patient improved his uh, KPS for 90. Let's move to the extreme situation. This is another melanoma patient. The disease is totally under control below the neck and has this uh, bleeding in the right insula. And then I had this call, emergency call. The patient is an isochoric and a KPS of a 10. Okay, game over. 
let's uh, you know bury this patient is unfortunately we cannot offer is that the, the right thing to do let's talk this is a, like a, a bleeding uh, critical uh, situation for us neurosurgery and neurosurgeons i'm sure if this patient is not an oncological one you guys are going to operate it so let's call to the oncology and understand the disease and see if this patient has some kind of good perspectives uh, in this new molecular uh, era and the patient yes indeed uh, he had so let's let's do it like emergency surgery and the patient recover his KPS for 70 after seven days of surgery. So this, this uh, traditional protocols about a, a low KPS or aging as well, like a patient's over 70 years, let's do nothing. This is not only, and we not should apply isolated all these criteria. Let's for each patient have, uh, uh, have their, they are multidisciplinary discussion, trying to find the best uh, treatment option for each patient. Coming back to the case that I present before, the patient with a 12 melanoma lesions, it's a negative, uh, BRF negative, uh, some of them with edema, we decided to operate it. the edema ones, even the smaller ones, because this patient uh, was uh, uh, immunocandidated, this is uh, after removing six lesions that were causing edema in two crannies and uh, the patient received a uh, and neva and after 30 days whole brain radiation. This is the patient over one year after treatment. There's no disease into the brain. And then we just uh, highlighted that, oh, indeed that we did a good thing, looking retrospectively. But uh, if, uh, if I just show to us the first uh, panel of diseases, you can just argue with me that, oh, this is not a surgical patient. And uh, maybe you're right, we never know. But in this case, in this context of a immune candidate, it was a good option. We have this, all these uh, surgical tools, but I'd like to highlight uh, the navigation, the ultrasound, uh, the interoperative MRI. Ultrasound for me is a, is a it's a big player and maybe it's the main tool. Why is that? Because it's easy, it's cheap, it's available in all OR by law in Brazil because the anesthesiology might uh, uh, function uh, vessels guided by ultrasound over here and probably all over the world. It helped you finding the, lo the lesion location, helped you in the surgical strategy, helped you uh, uh, um, in the dif differentiation of uh, edema and lesion, and even after resection, the residual tumor. This is an example that I mentioned before. It's a small lesion that uh, you might have some difficulty to find it. You have the brain shift and the navigation could uh, uh, let you go in the wrong way, uh, uh, do this, uh, uh, the brain shift, and then you can uh, use the ultrasound and uh, help you used to help you in the in your surgical strategy trying to achieve an, a name block resection even for small lesions like uh, i just uh, mentioned to you this is another example of this lesion in the the motor sensory area and uh, a small craniotomy so neural navigation is very good for this uh, taylor red crannies and this is important for oncological patient because we should discharge this patient soon from hospital and uh, he should be uh, able to start uh, his uh, treatment as soon as possible. So uh, tailored craniotomies are very interesting, but should be enough for you to do your interoperative movement. In this case, the ultrasound, we had the lesion and we are not sure if the lesion is at the motor of the sensory, but you can see in the middle, of the ultrasound, the, the central circles. And then we decided uh, going up front, then going backwards. You can see the, the fissure, the, the, the central circles in the middle of the lesion. And we decided to do a resection in two parts. The anterior part, uh, the, the pio resection, anterior and posterior, trying to avoid coagulations of the main uh, uh, vessels, the main truck vessels that are used to run into the pile uh, in the central circles. 
and this is after resection. You can use any strategy jet that you are using. You can do like a transsoco resection to an in block resection, a transcortical one, a trans uh, uh, fissure, uh, Sylvian fissure is, uh, or transsoco, depending on your strategy. And uh, just to, to mention that uh, your craniotomy should be uh, as big as enough or tailored. Uh, and tailor it to, for you to do intraoperative monitoring. Regarding intraoperative monitoring, we should uh, apply a continuous intraoperative monitoring. Not only identify where is motor, where is, where is sensory, where is the tract, but uh, doing the resection, especially when you are doing like an end block resection, dissected with your probe. You, now we have uh, this kind of probe that is pretty much like a pain field and then you have a real-time intraoperative monitoring or use the suction probe when you are, you, you are uh, resecting and suction uh, at the, the, gl the glial surrounding glial uh, tissue. This is an example of this lesion in the motor strip and you use this technique, uh, you have a very good uh, outcome for the patient. In our experience that we published before, for lesions located in, uh, in an eloquent brain, we have uh, over uh, 185 patients. And uh, unfortunately, for these locations in eloquent brain, we have only less than 50% of end block resection, and I'm gonna show you why this is important. But we, we also have a complication rate of uh, 15%. Let's uh, keep uh, this number in mind uh, because we are gonna compare with uh, radio surgery further on. This is a case uh, that uh, didn't uh, work well. Uh, I, I could not reach this lesion without uh, impair the patient. I have uh, uh, some uh, kind of positive uh, testing for many uh, nuclei when I trying to reach the lesion into this patient was treated before with radio surgery twice. And I have some difficulties to reach this lesion and the patient after resection presented a worseness, a clinical worseness, a neurological worseness after surgery. But uh, when we look carefully to the literature, uh, we can see that uh, we have a few complications and overall complications followed by a, a craniotomy for brain meds. We have this kind of concern that this is a critical patient because it's an oncological patient, but uh, when you are looking for pneumonia, uh, uh, VTI or uh, urinary tract infection and sepsis and so on. Uh, we have a low rates, uh, fortunately. But uh, in one situation, I, I would like to highlight uh, uh, the importance of location and the uh, infratentorial tumors are uh, related with a long uh, extended of stay and reoperation rates and readmissions and fistulas and uh, neurological problems and mainly to the, the secondary uh, or uh, carcinomatosis, uh, meningeal carcinomatosis for these patients. So factors that, uh, that affect the local recurrence, definitely size. The histology sarcoma, that uh, is the only one that uh, might have some kind of uh, brain invasiveness, not only uh, extra, uh, uh, extra brain disease, and uh, patients that uh, did not receive end block resection. So the surgical technique is very important, uh, uh, mainly trying to avoid the leptomeningeal disease and the local recurrence, and definitely your in block resection is critical to avoid this kind of a situation. I mentioned before that carcinomatosis and leptomeningeal disease are a terrible uh, progression of the brain uh, cancer and uh, usually related with a low survival rate. But uh, if you are dealing with uh, lesions in, at the posterior fossa, you have an annual risk of up to 25. And if you are operated patients over there, definitely you should take care about your surgical strategy. I mean, pre and post op are gonna mention that uh, further on. This is another interesting MD Anderson paper, but uh, if I achieve uh, end block resection, why should I submit my patient to, to a complementary or adjuvant uh, uh, radiotherapy. 
uh, radio surgery for surgical cavity or even uh, whole brain radiation. Indeed, uh, uh, if you add some uh, radiotherapy for your patient after surgery, like a patch you mentioned before in 1990, you have a good uh, or better results for local and distant failure, that's for sure. But, uh, and the Anderson, so far, they tend uh, to not uh, apply immediately after surgery and then block, clearly in block resection any sort of uh, uh, radiotherapy after surgery. And this is interesting and maybe should be considered as well. For multiple brain meds, you can do simultaneous tailored craniotomies or even in one craniotomy, you can address uh, many lesions as, uh, that, that you wish. This is another example, but uh, we just uh, keep in mind that uh, for each craniotomy, we have around 80% of complication. So if you'd like to do like a five or six crannies, probably your patient is going to have some kind of problem in, your, in the, in the post-operative uh, uh, evolution. Regarding the posterior fossa, as I mentioned before, we should uh, look carefully for this patient. This is a very interesting retrospective uh, study at MD Anderson comparing piecemeal resection, in-block resection, and radio surgery. And definitely the piecemeal uh, resection were uh, significantly re related with uh, leptomeningeal disease after uh, the treatment. This is the classic uh, end block uh, resection that uh, should be addressed. And considering that, we are going to discuss a combined uh, local uh, treatment uh, surgery for uh, radio surgery after surgery or radio surgery uh, prior uh, surgery. And this is a, a specific situation that, in my point of view, should be uh, uh, that, that uh, definitely fit well for this kind of patient to do pre-operative radio surgery for posterior fossa uh, lesions, but we're gonna mention this afterwards. So for the impact of surgery, definitely we, uh, we have this uh, relation with uh, a rapid uh, steroids drop off, fast ne neurological recovery, easy radiological interpretation. This is very interesting because now we are dealing with all these uh, uh, new treatment strategies like uh, immunotherapy and target, target therapy and uh, we have this, you have to do these renal criteria and uh, have our interpretation of these results. Most of these patients uh, uh, used to, to present uh, some kind of uh, uh, increase in size like inflammatory burden uh, related to treatment but uh, we are still trying to understand uh, this radiological interpretation but if you don't have lesion like a previously removed with surgery, it's easy to understand uh, this kind of uh, uh, radiological interpretation. And after surgery, it's easy to have a brain, uh, proper brain management for our patients. We have some additional criteria that uh, uh, recently are highlighting, like uh, gliomas, that uh, the new gene sequences are becoming more and more important and maybe you should uh, reoperate uh, your patient to get some samples uh, for patients with, glio with uh, glioma and then you can have this uh, new gene sequences and, uh, and uh, upgrade uh, your treatment for brain meds. And uh, I'd like to, to mention that uh, Dr. Brastianos from Boston, she, she spent her whole life uh, studying this kind of patients just uh, presented to us nice papers that uh, the, uh, most of uh, over 50% of these patients had different trial, the same histology but in a different uh, uh, marker a different biomarker a different uh, gene or molecular important molecular driver and uh, you can change your uh, your treatment based on this uh, new biopsy. So maybe in the near future, the new molecular and, and uh, you, you might have a new molecular and genetic uh, diagnosis when the disease reach the brain, even if you have like a, a prior uh, primary diagnosis at the lung or breast or whatever. We have this uh, new strategies, I mean LEAT, 
I have absolutely no experience, and this is my good friend, uh, Sujit and uh, Diego, uh, good friends that uh, are doing a great uh, job uh, with, uh, with uh, this uh, new strategy. Maybe our panelists can help me uh, uh, explaining better this kind of uh, thermal burning disease strategy, like a leak that you have this thermal uh, control. But this is also interesting for radio necrosis as well not only progression after radio surgery or up front, but I, I've been seeing uh, specific uh, tricky locations treated with lead with a good results. And this is interesting, like this thalamic lesion or brain stem lesion like that uh, one that I mentioned before, and I impair my patient after my surgery. And uh, maybe lead uh, should be a good uh, tool uh, for those patients. Regarding radiotherapy for many years, these are two Brazilians that it's a, they are UFC fighters. UFC in Brazil after soccer is becoming the, the most popular sport. We have a lot of Brazilian practicing this uh, gentle sports uh, called MMA. And uh, for many years, uh, we, we've been fighting with uh, radio oncologists trying to prove that surgery is better than radio surgery. Then they were trying to prove that radio surgery were better than uh, surgery. I was part of this, this process uh, during my career. I've been doing like a meta-analysis and publishing some papers and, and for sure in this, all this retrospective, uh, not uh, uh, level one science-based medicine, we have uh, this, uh, papers that uh, suggest that the surgery is better, others that the radio surgery is better, others that they are similar. But we have a trend, this is the MD Anderson number, that uh, people are operating less and treating more patients with radio surgery. This is a fact. I can notice this in my clinic and maybe you guys can notice in, in your clinic that uh, definitely radio surgery is effective and it's increasing in number comparing with uh, surgery. When we compare the beginning of radio surgery, most of patients used to be treated with surgery and now most of patients are treated with uh, radio surgery. The real eff effectiveness and the complications rate, this is important. Uh, uh, this is some of the, our publications, but uh, we noticed that uh, in our multivariated analysis uh, regarding outcome and location that uh, the primary status if the lesion is located in a functional eloquent brain area and volume for sure these are positive uh, factors that uh, uh, are significant for failure in neurosurgery in radio for radio surgery talking about uh, complication rate for lesions located in uh, eloquent areas like motor, sensory, brain stem, and speech areas, we have a complication rate of uh, 22%. Coming back to my series, a surgical series, we had uh, this complication rate of 15%. So the traditional trend, oh, the lesion is located in the motor, let's do radio surgery. Probably you might uh, uh, put your, your patient in a higher risk. Depending on the size, depending on how deep your lesion is, maybe surgery should be, especially regarding this, uh, this uh, fast uh, steroids drop off, um, uh, surgery should be a good option, even in, in lesions located in eloquent brain. We also published that uh, the radio necrosis is only radio necrosis in one third of patients. The rest of them are a mix of uh, treatment effect than even uh, uh, treat, uh, disease progression. So when you're doing like a, a pathological uh, analysis of uh, after removal of this patient. So when we see like a radio necrosis, we might have this in mind that uh, maybe you are dealing with a truly progression of the disease. And we might uh, have this concept that the radio surgery is definitely eff effective for all histologies mainly at the first year but the, this effectiveness is you know you have this uh, uh, is a decreasing uh, rate of uh, effectiveness during 
the long uh, or, or during the, the life of the, the patient, especially after one year. So if you have a, a patient that a might or you expected for him to live longer, maybe you should consider his surgery uh, as uh, your main uh, or your, your, your current uh, treatment option at that time for that patient. Especially because of this, the, the, the faster uh, steroids drop off. But uh, this is again the MD Anderson series that uh, people, you know, can uh, do an MRI easier and easier. If you have any complaint, okay, let's redo MRI and uh, you are treating smaller and smaller lesions with radio surgery. And this is good. You have a local control as soon as possible. The disease is just a diagnosis. Regarding size, this is a critical issue as well. I will, for the last uh, 15 years, I used to have this concept of uh, this magic number of three centimeters. Okay, it's bigger than three centimeters. Let's do surgery. Oh, okay, it's uh, smaller than three centimeters. Let's do radio surgery. This is the concept that uh, I, I learned. It. But when we look carefully, carefully for this uh, Sean, the RTOG toxicity grade three and four, and uh, we compare size, we have these big groups of uh, up to two, to two centimeters. You have uh, like a 10% of complications. Between two and three, we have, uh, depending on the dose, maybe 25% of complications. And over three centimeters, depending on the dose, 15 to 33. So why three centimeters is the magic number? How about the 2.9? How about 3.1? And these big groups. And for me, there is no huge difference between uh, uh, these two groups of uh, two to three and over three. And uh, when you look uh, for the new publications regarding size, the smaller lesions definitely has a great outcome in local control treated with radio surgery. So in my point of view, we should uh, just uh, forgive and, uh, and forget all these uh, three centimeters uh, magic number and treat uh, smaller lesions with radio surgery. As I mentioned before, it can fail and the fail uh, in long-term follow-up of this patient is over 30% with radio surgery. But as I mentioned, I was trying to prove that a surgery might be superior uh, than uh, radio surgery. And then we realized that we are friends. We should work together. Why not uh, operate uh, bigger lesions and uh, do radio surgery for smaller? Or why not combine uh, sur uh, radio surgery after surgery, doing like a surgical cavity? And this is the new or the, the recent uh, trend that we are dealing with. Uh, I mentioned about immunotherapy and radio surgery definitely has this kind of a peculiar uh, aspect, the abscopal effect. If you treat one lesion with radio surgery and then you do immunotherapy, basically by maybe presenting some new antigens and uh, you know the disease into the brain for new lesions or other lesions not treated the lesion the lesions shrink so we, we definitely you have this uh, synerg uh, synergistic effect uh, with uh, radiotherapy and immunotherapy and should this should be considered uh, nowadays as well but uh, we have this problem of timing what you should do first they, they ask your opinion, we have a lesion into the brain. Oh, let's do radio surgery and then start immune. Oh, let's start immune and then do radio surgery. Let's operate it and then do. We are still, this is, not, this is still unclear for us the precise timing for uh, upfront uh, treatment. If, if we should start with surgery, with radio surgery, with some kind of a target therapy or immunotherapy as well. And this is how science is basically uh, defining the, our near future regarding our upfront uh, strategy to how to treat the uh, brain meds. There is no limit nowadays to treat uh, in number regarding numbers with uh, uh, radio surgery. We have this uh, old concept of oh, up to 
four lesions, radio surgery, over four lesions, let's do whole brain radiations after this uh, classic Yamamoto publication comparing uh, 10 lesions and uh, uh, oligometastatic uh, disease, we have a very good results. I've been uh, presenting lectures all over the world and I'm surprised that uh, I'm seeing like a 75 lesions treated with radio surgery, 50 something, 60 something. So it clearly there is no magic uh, uh, limited number for all of uh, these patients. So radio surgery is very good for local control. You, this is an outpatient treatment. Uh, it's a low acute uh, morbidity, uh, minimal invasive uh, concept. Uh, this is a uh, you have this new trend of combining radio surgery with a new uh, strategic uh, uh, immuno or target ball uh, treatment, but we still have uh, differences in eff effectiveness and complications rates regarding location, size, and the primary uh, disease as well. And uh, the recent trend of a surgical cavity as well, it's interesting, it's elegant, and uh, you avoid whole brain radiation. This is a, a, a retrospective studies, like a meta-analysis, and when you look carefully for local recurrence with this, this strategy, radio surgery, as, uh, following surgery, we have uh, this uh, uh, local recurrence uh, between uh, five to 25%. But uh, when we come back to the classic patch publications or other publications following surgery and whole brain radiation, we have a similar numbers. So radio surgery followed uh, to, to, to surgical cavity compared with a whole brain radiation, you have uh, uh, similar numbers, but the fact of a whole brain radiation, you, you might have a long, a better long-term uh, uh, follow-up outcomes. This is uh, uh, the, the Paul Brown publication and uh, it's very interesting that comparing at the three, six and 12 months, if you treated these patients for local and distant control with a whole brain radiation, it's still on. So we are trying to avoid whole brain radiation, but this is still good a tool. It's a, it's, a, it's a good treatment option so far when we compare outcomes. But uh, when we compare uh, quality of life and neurocognitive uh, status, definitely we might have some problems. Whole brain radiation are or used to be associated with uh, uh, bad uh, neurocognitive uh, uh, outcomes and, uh, and a clinical decline of patients where, when comp where we compare with uh, radio surgery. But uh, this is another interesting Apple Brown slide. Uh, and uh, that uh, he just presented that uh, this uh, snow meeting. That, uh, why should this patient present uh, this kind of uh, neurocognitive deficits? Is there only whole brain radiation fault or you might have some kind of uh, tumor location and progression, other complications that uh, regarding cancer, like uh, medications, depression, epilepsy, infections, and so on. And, um, if you apply some kind of uh, neuroprotective uh, tools, I mean, uh, memantine and uh, hippocampus spare, I mean, it, you might have a good results as we have with uh, radio surgery to the surgical cavity. But we have this new current trend. Why not use radio surgery prior to your surgery? And this is same thing. But why should we apply this new concept of uh, pre-op uh, radio surgery? Comparing the two main complications regarding radio surgery followed, followed by uh, followed surgery, we have a high number of uh, leptomeningeal disease and. Uh, radio necrosis. You can imagine that uh, you uh, you have like a surgical burden of, with a lot of uh, hemostasis and coagulation, and then you are going to do 20 grays uh, to this uh, to this area that is suffering from your surgery as well. So, doing a prior radio surgery to your surgery, you have better 
results regarding uh, meningeal carcinomatosis and radionecrosis as well. So this is, in my point of view, our current trend. And regarding the, our concern about uh, lesions located in posterior fossa, maybe this is, should be a good strategy. Even if you have like a three centimeters or a big lesion in posterior fossa, if we apply this uh, pre-op uh, combined uh, treatment uh, strategy, you might have a lower rate of uh, carcinomatosis. So for us in our group, we have uh, two cases so far, it's not a big series because we are just applying this technique for posterior fossa lesions. We are doing pre-op radio surgery to our patients. This is an example. Imagine as well for, for a radio oncologist, for him it's really easy to do the radio surgical planning for a lesion like this. You, you can draw this in five minutes. Oh, the lesion is here, let's do our plan and let's apply 20, 22 grays, even a higher doses, because after five to seven days, I'm gonna remove it. On the other hand, if I have all this surgical, uh, surgical cavity, with uh, some kind of swelling and uh, some kind of uh, hematic uh, uh, surgery cell or something and the brain is a kind of collapsing to do the precise surgical cavity uh, treatment is not as good as doing in a situation like this. That makes sense that become easier to the radio oncologist to treat a lesion than a surgical cavity as well. I unfortunately have only uh, a 14 cases experience, uh, but in my point of view, it seems to be a good option to, to, to treat uh, this patient with this uh, combined uh, pre-op radio surgery strategy. Many years ago, I published in, uh, in some books, this is in Portuguese, a kind of a flow chart uh, treatment, and then I realized that I'm a dumbass, because after two years, it, uh, it's uh, worthless. It's completely different because things are changing in the neuro-oncological uh, point of view for brain meds. And we, ha we might have this concept. Even if we try to, to ask to our friends from NCCN guidelines from 2012 until now, if you have a resecable re uh, lesion, you can apply surgery or you can apply radio surgery or you can apply one followed by the other or you can apply whole brain radiation after or before, whatever. You can do whatever you want. So you don't have like a specific treatment. That's the importance. This is just to, to highlight the importance to do multidisciplinary approach for your patients. We don't have a flow chart, but uh, we have this kind of directions that we establish in our group that uh, for all cases, we try to do a multidisciplinary approach and think as a neurosurgeon about uh, maybe this patient is an immune or target uh, candidate. Lesions is smaller than 1.5 centimeters. We have a trend to do radio surgery, bigger to do surgery. In block resection, uh, we maybe we can use or not radio surgery but uh, now we are applying a pre-op radio surgery to all patients piecemeal resection just uh, uh, make in mind that uh, your patient must receive any kind of a radio therapy after your surgery so the type of surgery is critical for you to deal with the disease um, in a multi in multidisciplinary approach. For posterior fossa tumors, we might discuss the variable of uh, whole brain radiation, but in my point of view, we might uh, do some kind of a pre-op radio surgery. And maybe, I don't have the experience so far, but I just applied for two cases, we might have a lower rate of uh, leptomeningeal disease for these patients. And put in mind that, uh, despite the fact of how we treated the brain, the primary status will define the outcome of our patient. If the disease is progression, we kind of a sort of treatment, we are gonna have problems into the brain as well, despite the way that you treat your patients.
we should stratify, understand the histology and name and surname of the disease. We can apply the personal treatment, I mean precision individual treatment for our patients and not only trend medicine. Oh, let's do this, this is interesting. Let's try to not follow protocols, but understand each patient and which uh, treatment options will fit better to each patient. Surgery is still safe and it is still a good option and our goal in our surgery should be an end block resection. Unfortunately for, for lesions located in the eloquent brain, it, it might not be uh, feasible. Always put in mind that your patient might be a immuno or target uh, therapy candidate and always apply a multidisciplinary approach for a brain met patient. This is us looking to the brain, but uh, not anymore. We should understand the disease and uh, understand as well that uh, we should not uh, uh, deal alone. We are not on, we, we not on the patient. This is a multidisciplinary patient and we are still an important part of this uh, team work uh, uh, dealing with this uh, brain mats uh, disease. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was really uh, one of the most comprehensive talks on, on brain mints that I think I've, I've heard in a long time. So that was, uh, that was really outstanding. I know you went a little over time, but it was really, really important information, I felt. Um, just a couple of questions that we have here. Um, one question from the audience is uh, tumors that uh, are dural-based, and, and you're trying to understand if they're meningiomas or metastasis. They have a history of maybe of, of cancer. Uh, what is your strategy for both kind of preoperative imaging and also for surgery? So first we should realize that uh, we might have a dural based metastasis and this is, might not be a carcinomatosis. And uh, this is the first issue. And we should apply like uh, dual resection as well, if it's, if, if it's feasible. If it's not feasible like a uh, skull base, uh, dural based uh, metastasis, we should uh, complement uh, the whole dura into the, the radiation after surgery treatment. So this is the, the, the first uh, issue. As you mentioned before, the traditional MRI uh, should uh, be done and focus in, the, in the, this, uh, this uh, dural analysis, but your patient might receive a pre-op uh, CSF analysis as well. Because if it's possible, you might do surgery, but uh, your patient might receive uh, whole brain radiation after treatment. So if you have this, oh, I'm not sure if it, this is a dural base of the metastasis or even a carcinomatosis with a, a lesion specific in one area, you, you might uh, do, you must do a CSF prior to your surgery and then define with your multidisciplinary team the best approach for this patient. Great. Uh, one question I had is, you know, following up on Dr. Brasiano's work with this idea that some of the mutation statuses are different intracranially than they are in the body, uh, do you think there's going to be a time a, a, where we will need to be biopsying maybe tumors that are resistant um, just to find out, again, you know, even if somebody had multiple mets in the brain to biopsy just to get their, their kind of molecular profile uh, to see if there's another agent that maybe we haven't tried yet? Uh, this is an this is, uh, important question. The numbers are high. We, we are talking about uh, over 50% of uh, you know, surname differences. Well, it's the same histology, but uh, it's a, probably a different uh, troncal, clonal uh, cancer that are developing. So you just uh, selected the patient after some prior treatment. Oh, he received like a specific EGFR drug. Okay, good. And now we have recurrence. This is the main question, why this is just fail, fail. Probably it's a new, you know, clonal cells. And you, so I totally agree with you. We might discuss the, the to biopsy or remove this lesion to have a new sample and, and just check if uh, we are dealing with the same disease based in the different surname. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think in the past, a lot of us have blamed the blood-brain barrier for 
and penetrance for why things are not working in the brain, but I think this brings a whole new concept as to different kind of mutations that may be happening. I know we're, we, we have our panelists and I know they're busy, so I want to get to their uh, cases next. So maybe Dr. Rodriguez, if you want to start. Sure, absolutely. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. I want to thank Dr. Maldon for such a wonderful talk and to also emphasize how surgery isn't going away. And similar to uh, making an MMA reference, I grew up watching the Gracie brothers. So like think kind of surgery is kind of like them. It's just not going to go away. It's a classic. So that's kind of what I took away from your talk. So um, let me switch this. All right, so my patient is a 60-year-old female who presented two years after her initial diagnosis. She had a melanoma, and she had a local excision of a, a back lesion. The margins and lymph nodes were negative, and she did not receive any adjuvant therapy. But she came in with headaches and confusion, as well as just difficulty completing tasks at work, uh, she's actually a cook, and she just couldn't remember how to do things. And now on exam, she had some mild uh, left-sided weakness. So I'll just go ahead and show the, the imaging. This is her MRI on presentation. So um, here we see that she ends up having a total of 15 lesions uh, with the largest in the right insula slash basal ganglia. And then the second largest uh, being near the splenium. So again, um, 15 total lesions. And uh, I don't know if we want any input on what Dr. Muldone would do, but I guess we'll wait till after um, presenting this case. But we ended up um, taking out uh, the largest lesion. So I talked to the radiation oncology team. I felt that she was symptomatic, obviously, and uh, elected to take out her largest lesion. And I, I ended up using the brain path uh, device. I, I really like those for deep lesions. So I did a transsocal approach and uh, kind of mapped out her tracks and was able to get a complete resection. And then we follow this up within a week, we ended up doing uh, SRS to each of the remaining lesions as well as to the cavity. So uh, each of the smaller lesions got about 20 gray and then we fractionated the resection cavity and that splenium lesion uh, got three fractions of nine gray each. So again, this is just showing the post-op films. And then uh, she was mutated. She had a BRAF mutation, started on BRAF and MEK inhi inhibition. And this is her a year later. Um, approximately nine months later, she had some areas of recurrence that were treated with SRS. This is her a year later. Thankfully, this lesion back there actually responded uh, to SRS. Um, So I don't know if we wanted to get Dr. Maldon's insights or... Yeah, yeah, for sure. That was a great, great outcome. Indeed, I just would like to thank you because you just resumed my talk in, in two minutes. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so this is, this is the, the main issue. So we have to work together. So we have your radio oncologist concern about uh, the lesion size. But indeed, your patient is, uh, is a target can candidate for uh, BRAF and inhibitors and MEK inhibitors, as you mentioned before, with a very good uh, brain uh, result. Even if, you're, if your patient uh, is not a, a BRAF mutated patient, you might, your patient might uh, receive uh, immunotherapy. And then your surgery is definitely feasible as well, just to make uh, him uh, steroids free. So, you know, you just manage perfectly your case and, uh, you know, putting all together all these new concepts for us, neurosurgery, this is uh, how 
a patient should be arrested in a multidisciplinary program. It's interesting because they still have like a, you know, more than 10 lesions and uh, was treated with a radio surgery. Just, this is interesting. We can see the abscopal effect of uh, target therapy with uh, radio surgery. We can just try to understand the oncogenetical uh, features and ra radio biological features of radio surgery. You, you just uh, present uh, some kind of antigens and uh, ketokines of uh, like a, uh, interleucines in that microenvironment and and make it this uh, this uh, lesion treatable and then you have like a distant uh, uh, response or good response uh, in lesions not treated but uh, this is a very good example that summarizes everything that I've talked in one one hour thank you yeah, excellent. I mean, I think a lot of times these melanoma patients, when they present with a large lesion with many others, it's because one of them bled. So this was a little bit unusual because you had one that was, it looked solid and that, that's a hard tumor to take out. So, so congratulations. It's a great job. And, and I think that just understates what Dr. Muldoon is saying is that the number of tumors isn't necessarily uh, as important as, as kind of the size and all the other features of the patient and treat the patient, not just the, the image. Brian, do you want to uh, go next? Sure. So uh, my patient's a 58-year-old uh, gentleman with, uh, like many people in Kentucky, a long pack year uh, history of smoking, uh, presented with uh, right-sided hemiparesis uh, or left-sided hemiparesis and hemisensory disturbance uh, originally in 2016 um, and had a solitary lesion found. He has a history of uh, T2N0, M0, um, lung cancer, um, adenocarcinoma, ALK negative, EGFR negative that was uh, diagnosed about four years prior and he'd just been under surveillance. He never had chemotherapy. Um, and so with the solitary met, um, we're still living in Patchell's world. So uh, at the time the lesion was resected um, and got post-operative radio surgery, and then was observed. Uh, no further uh, metastases were noted. Um, the CT of the body at the time of uh, this image over here was uh, uh, negative. There was no other distant metastasis in the body. So still under surveillance, no chemotherapy. And then uh, when I took over his care, um, he came back and had recurrence at uh, the same site. Um, again, his body imaging was negative. Again, his, um, the rest of his brain was clear. So he had local recurrence. Um, and at this time, uh, I offered him uh, biopsy laser ablation versus craniotomy. And uh, he elected for biopsy laser ablation, which I thought was very reasonable. Um, and so uh, here's the laser catheter and the tumor uh, or whatever this was. Um, and there's the one month post-op. Uh, the biopsy had about 40% active uh, carcinoma. So he got, again, uh, fractionated radiation this time, uh, radio surgery, I should say, um, and was followed again. So this is him two years later. Um, and he comes back again and still has no disease in his body, still has no disease elsewhere in his brain. Uh, but. He's had two rounds of radio surgery, and uh, he doesn't have a good systemic option, and the lesion's rather big. Um, so, you know, in the we can talk about options now, or I can tell you what I did. Um, either way is fine. Uh, yeah, let's talk about uh, what everybody would do in this situation. It's a tough case. Uh, maybe Chris, do you want to go first? Sure. So it's, it's a tough case. You've had two surgeries. It's been radiated. You had a, a lit, um, but it seems like the lit didn't necessarily respond. So given that he has no um, systemic disease elsewhere, I, I think it would be unreasonable to offer him a second open surgery since he only had one open surgery. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez? Yes, I, I definitely think 
surgery, especially given how much edema he has. I just see that whole hemisphere has significant edema. Okay. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's definitely higher risk with, with the radiation being twice and chemotherapy with wound breakdown and whatnot, but he's got obvious significant mass effect. So. Yeah. So I, I'm in the boat with you guys. I, I think surgery is pretty good. So um, I wanted to get back in there, but um, for me, I thought, you know, uh, this is the post-op scan. So we did a, uh, went back down the same tract um, and you'll notice the radiologist got very happy about the edge of the tumor here. Um, but I thought the local control aspect, which we'd been struggling with obviously on this was um, uh, a challenge. And so with burning the bridge of two radio surgeries, our radiation oncologists didn't have a lot of uh, enthusiasm that anything else would be possible. So, um, the one wrinkle we did was we ordered a brachia or a um, cesium mesh and implanted that at the time. Um, and, and so we implanted a cesium mesh to try to improve our local control rate afterwards. Um, and he's about eight weeks out from surgery now, uh, this one that we did here. Um, and he's doing well as hemiparesis and hemisensor disturbance improved. So surgery still works, but we're not sure if this is gonna hold or not. Hopefully it will. Dr. Muldoon, anything you would have done different there? No, just the season. I don't have this kind of experience with any kind of uh, wafers or bracket therapy or local. Uh, I mean, strategies. We know that some uh, for cases difficult like this with uh, bad uh, local behavior that are not. Uh, uh, controlled with uh, traditional surgery, radio surgery, and re-radio uh, uh, re, re, re surgery and whatever. Maybe this is, might be a solution. I have no, absolutely no experience. And uh, I just would like to thank you to highlight the lead importance as well. But uh, you melted the lesion, but uh, it's still aggressive. And um, I just would like to ask you if this uh, second, uh, this second and third surgery, you, if you have absolutely predominance of uh, disease, or if you have a lot of, a lot of uh, treatment. Uh, uh, I mean, treatment. Uh, uh, how can I say? Uh, treatment effect. I mean, it's a treatment effect, or mainly. Uh, truly residual uh, disease progression. What do yeah. you think? If your pathologist uh, just agreed that it's totally uh, disease progression or you, have, you may have uh, some kind of uh, treatment effect. Yeah, I mean, so with the lit, um, the, the, one of the downsides certainly of, of a biopsy lit approach is that even if you do the biopsy, you still have sampling bias. It's still a, a core of maybe 120th, 130th of the tumor. And so there's certainly, that can lead you astray. So about 40% of the, the needle biopsy we did showed active carcinoma. Um, so, you know, for whatever that's worth, that, you know, suggests that there's still active cancer there. Um, with the surgical excision, it was 80% um, active cancer and we took out uh, the majority of it. So, you know, I, I feel like the um, lesion is coming back from, you know, two things. I think, you know, the lit can always be improved a little bit and I don't always get the best heat spread. And so we had over a 90% ablation of it, which is, is pretty reasonable with active cancer at that site. My sort of practice bias is to treat with radio surgery afterwards, especially if it's um, over a quarter um, active carcinoma in the biopsy. Um, and, and, and go from there. As to why this has come back sort of every um, two to three years on sort of like a metronome, that's a, a separate question. And, and why hasn't it spread anywhere else if it's so aggressive? Um, that's also a separate question. It, it, it looked like a sarcoma behavior. I mean, it's, you have a huge uh, local recurrence so with not uh, sarcoma used to, to behavior like this. But uh, I'm just asking, asking you that because in case that you have a predominance of uh, treatment uh, effect, maybe we should uh, use uh, anti-angiogenic uh, uh, agents like a bevacizumab after your surgery instead to use the season that I had no experience and hopefully you're going to work. 
And uh, so if you have this uh, predominance of uh, treatment effect, uh, we might uh, consider in the use of bevacizumab uh, or uh, other angiogenic uh, uh, options. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing else too I would say, Brian, is, is um, you know, the lit isn't like radio surgery and, and you, we could, you know, here we've done, uh, we have a pretty large series of over 120 brain tumors. And of those, I think uh, we're up to now seven that we've patients that we've retreated uh, after it's regrown. So treated with lit, again, had a very good ablation, like you said. And then a year, year and a half later, you have the small recurrence. And we've gone back in there and just did a second lit when it was small. Obviously here it cats out of the bag. But, um, you, you know, if, if a patient has good follow-up and they're able to kind of get frequent scans, sometimes you could, you could touch up with the lit coming, coming from a separate trajectory. I don't know if you have experienced that at all as well. Yeah, I have a, um, a reasonable experience with stage lit. Um, um, and uh, the golden question is, um, you know, for, for you or for, for us is getting it at the right time. And then is it uh, staged in terms of the planned, you know, two-stage lit at the outset versus a follow-up and watch and see approach? Um, and that part I haven't, I haven't well worked out for myself yet when I don't get a perfect ablation, but I'm working on it. Okay, thanks again, a great outcome uh, so far. Chris? Yep. So thank you so much, Dr. Maldon, it was a fantastic talk. And uh, glad to be back with the Miami Global uh, Symposium team. As uh, Mike mentioned, I uh, completed my fellowship there in neurosurgical oncology uh, last year in 2019. So we'll finish this off with a um, nice case here. It's a patient, uh, 63 years old. She was diagnosed with stage four invasive ductal carcinoma of the right breast, status, status post modified radical mastectomy and angina chemo radiation. Uh, we had a, uh, the importance of multidisciplinary approaches. Dr. Maldon mentioned we had a uh, oncologist and radiation oncologist and myself in the tumor board and they referred this patient to me with a sharp throbbing, constant headache, and dizziness. Uh, neurologically, she was intact. Uh, on the MRI, we, we could not get a contrast scan due to her kidney disease. So it's a non-contrast scan that shows a, a 1.5 by 1.4 centimeter um, solitary right frontal uh, brain met just anterior to the motor cortex. So given its location, uh, you know, a couple thoughts came to mind in terms of whether to do this uh, awake versus uh, doing it with um, cortical mapping uh, with MEPs um, and decided uh, to proceed uh, with uh, MEPs and, and cortical mapping um, in this case. So we took her for a right frontal craniotomy and tumor resection. We did a hair sparing linear incision. We marked out the area with navigation and then uh, with cortical brain mapping using a neurostimulator uh, with five milli amplitudes over the cortex, we uh, found no stimulation. And then, as Dr. Maldon mentioned, uh, using the um, probe as a dissector through the, through the surgery, we performed an on-block tumor resection. Uh, Frozen came back as metastatic carcinoma, and uh, she tolerated well. She was a uh, neuro exam, was intact at baseline, and we discharged, were able to discharge her from the ICU uh, post-op day one. Um, and then this was... Um, after this case, uh, we performed SRS boost uh, to the cavity, uh, 20 grays, and, and uh, this is an MRI now, nine months post-op with uh, no recurrence, uh, no residual, no recurrence. And one of the things, you know, you mentioned about the SRS, we're also working on a, a protocol right now to, to decide, you know, a, a trial whether to do it pre or post-op, like you mentioned. So that's something we're looking to, into as well. And is that of interest? Uh, who, who, who does uh, a motor cortex met awake and who does it asleep? Because I've, I've definitely been trained both ways. I do it awake. I like awake surgery. I do awake as well. Yeah, I prefer awake as well, uh, but the anesthesia was an issue in our case, so we had to we had to do it asleep with cortical mapping, but I definitely would prefer to do it awake. Dr. Maldon, what's your threshold for awake surgery for, for metastasis? I'm a very good, uh, f uh, you know, fan of awake uh, craniotomies. I have, a, you know, good experience for gliomas. But for brain mats, you know, considering that um, most patients have some kind of a lung uh, involvement and might have some kind of uh, uh, 
CO2, uh, uh, not well ventilated patients. In that case, if, 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 if the patients are very good the shape, I, I used to do awake. But uh, on the other hand, considering that this is not an infiltrative uh, tumor, uh, you know, it's, it's not wrong to do only uh, traditional motor uh, SPSS, um, you know, monitoring. But uh, I used to do awake as well, but I have this kind of concern regarding the, the lungs. Got it. Okay, great. Yeah, great case. Nice, nice job, Chris, and, and good outcome there. Um, okay, well, we're already over time, so I just want to thank everybody for taking the time out of your busy schedules. I know everybody here is extremely, extremely busy. Um, uh, it was a fantastic talk by Dr. Maldon and, and everybody else. Thank you for the cases. I hope everybody stays safe. Thank you. Thank you Thanks very so much. much. All right. Take care. Bye. Be safe, people.